So there's a couple interesting things happening here. When they first started looking, they were looking for one to two Earth masses. Then they went to five to 10 Earth masses. Now many people are at 20 plus Earth masses. I've seen some papers up to 99 Earth masses. And the reason is they keep finding more stuff that is affected. It's not just the dwarf planets, which are stretched in these elongated orbits that are highly inclined to the plane. Uh, it turns out that all the major planets, big heavy masses, uh, you know, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, are pulled down about six degrees from the sun's equator. And this shouldn't be happening without a big cause. So as they kind of look at this whole problem, they just keep needing more and more uh, mass to solve it. And so that's what's kind of going on right now. It's, it's pretty fun. You know, they've been looking for planets before. And I'll give you two uh, quick instances. Uh, one, uh, when Uranus was found in uh, 1781, they, they watched its orbit for a while. They noticed that um, at a certain point, it kind of seemed to be going off course. It showed a little perturbation. And so that told them that, oh, there's probably another mass out there that's affecting Uranus's orbit. And so the math was new, but they, they did it, and they figured out where this other planet should be. And within two days of the math being complete, they nailed uh, the position, and they found Neptune. And it was actually found by several people. Um, Adams and Levier are given uh, credit the most. And then uh, they watched Neptune for a while. And uh, you know, after 50, 75 years, something like that, they started to notice that it, too, was perturbating. So there must be another planet that's affecting Neptune. And again, they did the math. And in 1931, they found Pluto. And it was found within about 48 hours of the math being complete. So it's, uh, it's interesting. Now they're not just looking at one planet perturbating to look for the next one. They're looking at all the planets in the solar system being tugged sort of down and towards the southwest. And they happen to be looking in the direction of Orion, which just happens to be the direction that many of our ancient cultures had an interest in. Um, here's uh, you know the shape of Orion's belt. You've all probably heard of Orion correlation. Um, one of our speakers a few years ago talked about this in depth. But the three great pyramids in Egypt uh, seem to mimic this. And of course, they have many myths about uh, Orion. Really, I, th I think it's uh, Osiris uh, in Egypt. Some of the Egyptologists can correct me on that. And then in uh, Mexico, they also uh, have three very similar pyramids, the greatest pyramids in Mexico. So something's going on. The ancients are very interested in this area of the sky. And of course, now modern scientists are very interested in this area of the sky. Here's a, just a look at those pyramids from above, uh, comparing it to Orion's belt. And of course, as you know from my book, Lost Star of Myth and Time, I'm also interested in this very area of the sky, especially Sirius to the left and the Pleiades to the right. Uh, Sirius is just an amazing star that's uh, been the topic of much conversation by scientists for the last 1,000 years or so. Many books have been written on this. It doesn't seem to precess uh, like the other stars. I talked to Jed Buckwald about this. Jed is the, uh, uh, he's an astrophysicist and head of the history of science at MIT. And, um, and he said that he just uh, thought that maybe the horizon in Egypt was such that it just made it look like uh, Sirius wasn't processing. Uh, but then I talked to people in Canada who have also been plotting uh, Sirius for a long, long time. They have a much different horizon, a much different latitude, of course, and uh, they found the same thing. An interesting point about Sirius is that it's uh, the heaviest star in our local neighborhood. So in